Hey there everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. I got another good one for y'all today. We'll be taking a deep dive and listening to some scary let's not meet stories that were shared to me by listeners and viewers such as yourself. Now if this is the first time you're joining us, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of all future uploads. Also, if you're a current listener, do double check and make sure that you haven't been unsubscribed by YouTube. Unfortunately, it's been happening again, and I know it frustrates my subscribers, so I'm just trying to look out for you creepy fox listeners. Anyway, with all that said, let's get started with these scary stories, shall we? When I was about 6 years old, around 2004, my mom started taking my sister and I to Dr. Daniel's pediatric dental office. The dental center was located inside a giant yellow mansion. It also doubled as Dr. Daniel's house. It was honestly gorgeous. When I first started going to the dentist, I was extremely shy, and so actually I suffered from selective mutism, and I had a lot of autistic-like tendencies. Needless to say, I relied heavily on my mother's comfort and for someone to give me a voice because it was extremely anxiety inducing for me. I couldn't talk to strangers, especially men for some reason. When my sister and I got called in from the waiting room, my mom followed us to the office until she was told by Dr. Daniels that parents were not allowed to be with their children. It was supposedly because it taught independence to kids, to which my mom complied to. Once in there, he immediately separated my sister and I, and in reaction to that, I cried because I felt scared. Dr. Daniels did not like crying, so he grabbed me and put his hands over my mouth and nose. He then shook me and aggressively warned me that if I continued to cry and scare the other kids, well, he would make my situation a lot worse. Now, obviously, this scared me even more, so I started to cry again. And Dr. Daniels had enough, and so he took me into his house part of the dentist's office, where he proceeded to scream at me again. He then grabbed me by the neck and shoved me. His hygienist, Judy, came over and then told me if I continued to cry, well, she was going to spank me so hard I wouldn't know what had hit me. Afterwards, he gave me a juice concoction and left me alone in his house for about five minutes. Eventually, he took me back into the dental office and he did work on my teeth. I guess I just instinctively knew that if I wanted to survive, I just had to act like I was not terrified and so I had to hold on to the tears. All I really wanted though was my mommy. After the first appointment, my sister and I told my mom that we were scared of the dentist and that he was a mean man, but she just took it as me being an anxious child, and so we continued to see him. Each visit was just as terrifying. Every time we pulled into the mansion, my heart just melted away inside my chest, and I was so scared. It was no longer pretty to look at. Every time we went to the dentist, Dr. Daniels, or the tooth man as he called himself, always had us have heavy dental work procedures done. We had seals done on several baby teeth, as well as plenty of teeth removed, some which were done with fingers, with no regards to pain level at all. Also, often when having a tooth removal or seals done, your mouth had to be opened up with a retractor. He would leave us there with a retractor on for about 45 minutes or so, before he then came back to work on our teeth. Sometimes he would eat his lunch while we sat there with our open mouths. Probably one of the worst pains I've ever felt in my life. I remember one time when I was about in the third grade. I had been leaned down in the chair waiting with a retractor on for about an hour. I was in so much pain that I just couldn't take it. So I sat up on the chair and tried to scream and cry as loud as I could. Dr. Daniels came rushing over angry as could be. He took my retractors off and then took me back into his house part again, where he screamed at me for being a big baby and scaring all the other kids. I was so sad in myself, since I hadn't cried in so long. He then took me back to the dental chair 
and then pinned me down to my seat in a straitjacket. He put my retractors back on and then said that I would have to wait longer because I caused such a scene. All I could do was shed his silent tears and drool everywhere and I couldn't even wipe it because he locked up my arms. Afterwards, my mouth would become so swollen and filled with rashes and it hurt to talk for days. Anyway, it would leave bruises and swells as soon as I left his chair. He would often tell my mother I was a difficult patient if I so much as winced at his torture. Once he removed his six of my teeth at once and I could barely eat. While he ripped out the teeth, he would often sing songs. When I was in the seventh grade though, I started getting some new braces and we started seeing an orthodontist. Not long after that, we stopped seeing Dr. Dan and I started seeing a new dentist who was actually nice. I'd never known that getting your teeth clean didn't have to feel like going through a saw trap. I think my mom took us out of Dr. Dan's practice when the orthodontist looked at her dental records and he saw a lot of unnecessary procedures being done on her mouth. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about our childhood fears and instantly my mind went to the tooth man. Curious, I googled him to see what had happened to him and to my happiness, the practice was shut down. Also left under his name was a Yelp page that was still left up. The page was filled with numerous one-star reviews from former patients that were once abused as children in his office. They used the page as an outlet to express their trauma. I started to cry because their experiences were so close and some identical as to what I went through when I was a kid. It was so sad, but at the same time, it was really validating to know that I was not alone. A lot of the procedures we went through were just a scam for him to collect money off our parents' insurance. And now that I think about it, he probably was so adamant on us not crying and screaming for help since he didn't want parents to hear and come see what was going on. I just shake thinking about this. I really pray that he hasn't opened up another practice somewhere else. I know it's hard not to blame parents in this situation, but the truth is, this man was a swift abuser. For every bruise and swell that we had, he would have dental explanations that would make the parents feel stupid for asking. He was an authority figure. I don't blame my mom for not believing us. She knew he was firm, but probably thought we were confusing firmness with meanness. To be honest, even writing this, the torture was so wild it actually sounds made up. She eventually did come around though. She's not alone as there were hundreds and hundreds of parents that were duped and deceived by Dr. Dan. So to Dr. Dan, please never let us meet again. And to any parent reading this, if you are ever told not to go in with your child to an appointment, something's just not right. This story happened a few years ago, back when I was in my first year of college during Thanksgiving break. I went to college in a tiny town in central Utah, but I grew up in a city in Idaho that was a six hour drive from said tiny college town. For my entire life, my family has been poor, so they couldn't really afford to have Thanksgiving. Also, they couldn't drive down to central Utah to get me. I myself had some health problems in high school that made my grandparents, who I lived with the last year and a half of high school, decide not to teach me how to drive, get my license, or even help me get a car. I didn't turn 18 until after graduation, just a few weeks before I moved to Utah. There wasn't enough time for me to learn to drive, feel comfortable driving, get my license, or get a car. So I just bought a bus ticket to get to my family for Thanksgiving. Originally, I was going to stay in Utah for Thanksgiving and my grandpa would pick me up for Christmas vacation, but I was super homesick. I didn't know anyone very well and I just didn't want to be alone in my dorm for those five days. So a few weeks before, I bought a Greyhound bus ticket going from Salt Lake City directly to my hometown. I talked to my roommate who had agreed to drop me off at the bus station since she didn't live too far away from Salt Lake if I pitched in for gas, which is what I did. My grandpa agreed to pick me up at the place the bus would drop me off, 
which was a gas station in front of a Lowe's at 4 in the morning. I would then take a bus back to Salt Lake, where I agreed to meet my roommate and we'd go back home. My roommate and I leave at 8 in the evening and since my bus didn't leave until midnight and it still took about a 2 hour drive with non-stops to Salt Lake City. By the time we got there, there was about an hour and a half of time to kill, so I did so by sitting in a corner with all my stuff close to me, keeping my ears open but to myself. I do digital art as a hobby, and even though I was working on the bare basics back then, I still took out my tablet and worked on a project until it was time to load up. I had packed two bags which would go under the bus, plus I had a backpack for overhead luggage and a pillow and blanket to sleep on on the trip up there. I had some trouble grabbing my things though, and this bus station didn't have any trolleys. So I stumbled a lot and kept dropping my pillow. Eventually, I got things situated so I could actually board the bus. I handed the ticket to one of the workers. I smiled at him when I handed him my ticket, and I showed him the tags for my luggage, and then he took my ticket and said, I love you. This man was a complete stranger, so I was a little confused by what I heard. But I just dismissed it and put my two large bags in the bottom carriage of the bus. I boarded. I found a seat where I placed my blanket and pillow and tried to put my backpack in the overhead, but I was just too short to reach it. By then, everyone had boarded the bus and the loader guy came on the bus to help people. He saw me struggling and stood really close behind me, so he was rubbing against my back while he put my backpack in the overhead for me. I sat down in my seat as to get out of his way, however I was weirded out that he didn't excuse himself and was so willing to violate my personal space like that as if that's not a thing. When he was done, I thanked him for the help. He smiled at me and then did something that totally surprised, shocked, and scared me. He bent down, leaned in, eyes closed, mouth puckered, moving in to kiss me. He was maybe three or four inches from my face by the time I finally gathered my bearings, where I pushed his face away from me and said something like, No thank you, while still talking in my polite voice. The man immediately runs off the bus, and I've never seen him again. Now, I did experience sexual abuse as a child, and that event really scarred me. I was shaking for days. I couldn't sleep and I just burst into tears at the thought of getting on that bus and going back. My grandpa asked me what was wrong when we were discussing ticket prices, and I told them about the experience. He told me to report it to the Greyhound, but I didn't know the man's name. I don't remember if he was wearing a name tag. I don't think he was. I did give the number of the bus and the time, as well as the destination of the departure to the company. However, I never received a follow-up. Now, instead of buying a return ticket, my grandpa ended up driving me back to school. That was after borrowing money from my uncle, with the promise to pay him back when his social security check came in a few days. It's been just a little over two years, and I'm not really shaken up over that experience anymore, but I don't think I will ever go on another bus like that ever again. Forget it. Like I said, Greyhound never followed up with me in regards to the incident, so I doubt they did anything at all. I just hope some other poor girl was smarter than I was, and made sure that guy got fired. TLDR Creepy Greyhound employee mistakes a polite thank you as a declaration of love, and to my surprise, reciprocates mentally scarring me for the rest of my vacation. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends. However, since I had to go to university the following day, I only stayed until around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and to go home with me. That was because I don't like to take the subway alone at night. But since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus with multiple stops since the bus subway closes on weekdays at night. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together, but are very close to each other. 
around a 15 to 20 minutes walking distance. Both areas are actually pretty shitty. He lives near a train station, many crackheads, homeless, and sketchy people around, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets. It's because it is a corner building site, which leads to a patio and then to the apartment building and its doors. To get into my apartment, I actually have to open three doors. I usually use the entrance door that is nearer to the subway and on the side of my apartment. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting out of the first bus, we realized that we would have to wait for around 20 minutes or something for the second bus to come and since I really had to sleep at home, remember I had class the following day, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus, which sober me would have never done, but since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. So we started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people, mostly people selling drugs, etc., but nothing really bad happened. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I somehow got a bad feeling. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street since I didn't want to walk past him. Suddenly the guy yelled, hey, as if he wanted to ask us something. However, we ignored it until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over. So I whispered run to my boyfriend and I took his hand and ran the fastest I could while he was chasing us. We ran. We ran and ran and then made a turn to the right, the street where I live, and we hid. It seemed as if he was gone. So I took my keys out and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of my building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started to panic. He was throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively and then pushing me to the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut. Probably he was thinking we were going to run to the subway slash bus stops. If we hadn't taken the other entrance, he would have most likely been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately did not call the police, which I actually still regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for half a year after this and I slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks, since I was scared that he would come back. I think the worst thing about this though is that he really wanted to get us for whatever reason. I still want to know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl a few streets away was raped in front of her building by a guy who chased her home. I just wonder if it was the same guy, or perhaps it was just a coincidence. So when I was a kid, maybe 6 or 7 years old, this was the mid 1990s, we took a family trip to the beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house a short walking distance from the beach. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay inside of my mom. However, I wandered way down and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the homes looked the same and I wasn't sure which one was ours. Plus, I couldn't see my mom anywhere. It then started to rain. I came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house. Only, it didn't lead to a house at all, but instead to a parking lot. There was a big dirty van parked there. It was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back, but that's when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair, a hot pink tank top, and those big clunky thick glasses that were popular in the 80s. Well, she started waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, Oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy? Come on, let us take you to her. It's dangerous out here. You could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly. Almost overly so. In the driver's seat was a very overweight man without a shirt on, a hair gray chest, and some clunky looking gold chain. He was wearing yellow tinted elvis shades and staring at me intently. He was also smoking a cigarette, which I knew was bad. 
The woman stepped out of the van and then kneeled down to me. She asked how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, Oh my, we have two boys your age at her house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies. We've even got Nintendo. And in the morning, we've got all types of cereal as well. Now, I have been taught all about stranger danger, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady continued talking about stuff like how the boys have go-karts and they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old kid, and at this point, I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age. Then I remembered that I needed to ask my mom first. I told her this. She told me that that was no problem at all, that they actually lived just up the road. My mom shouldn't mind. It started raining harder, and she opened the sliding door of the van and said something like, Now, let's get you out of this rain and go find your mommy. I knew logically that I shouldn't do this, but the lady seemed really friendly, and I was desperately wanting to get out of the rain. As I walked toward the open door of the van, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head that something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked up at the fat man, who was not only staring at me with this menacing glare, but he had this really creepy, toothy smile, and his teeth were stained a dark yellow. I could pick up on a very messed up vibe from him. I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor had changed now. She was being demanding and trying to literally push me into the van. She sounded angry and said, Get in already, in a tone that was the complete opposite of how she had sounded before. I jumped to the side and then started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to quickly break free and run back to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was very overweight. I made it back to my mom, who was freaking out. I tried explaining what had happened to me. However, I don't think that at 7 years old, I was able to convey the gravity of what had happened to me, and I didn't fully understand it myself. I started working at my current summer slash part-time job last spring. I'm situated in a large old building that used to be a country club, but it fell into disrepair about 10 years ago. Now, although there's nothing paranormal about my story, it is maybe worth mentioning that the former manager committed suicide in the main office upstairs. That was when they went out of business. It adds to the unsettling quality of the place. Along with that, so do the seemingly never-ending hallways and passages. There's so many hidey holes and half-empty pools, and other strange unused parts of the building, such as a secret shower room slash sauna, and a tunnel of storage areas that connect the men's and women's bathrooms. There are also a lot of doors to the outside in this place. It makes sense for a country club. But currently, we only use one small room for the golf course check-in, the kitchen, as well as one dining room for the restaurant upstairs, and even the small cafe area for early morning golfers to get their coffee and beer. The cafe area is actually where I work. In the summer, we clock in to open the cafe before 6am, often before the sun comes up. The golf course's people come in pretty shortly after but I would be the first person in the building every morning. I would unlock the front door, disarm the alarm, walk downstairs in the dark, unlock this cage that keeps the drunkies at the bar upstairs at night from wandering downstairs. Then I would crawl along a long dark hallway with no windows to get to the light switch at the end of the hall. This always creeps me out, and I end up holding my keys between my fingers like brass knuckles. I'm a woman in my mid-twenties, and I've lived in plenty of bad neighborhoods. I ninja slide down the walls on the opposite side of whatever doorway is coming up, just because it's pitch black and I'm a scaredy bear. By the time I get to the end of the hall and flip the light on, 
My heart is already pounding out of my chest as I struggle to find the right key to let me into the cafe. And the whole situation started when Tim, a golf course employee, mentioned that he kept shutting the door between the men's locker room slash bathroom and the storage area that leads to the women's, and every time he would go back in there, it would be open again. This, along with some strange noises, was fodder for the bar regulars upstairs, as they claimed this place was haunted by the old manager, as well as whomever else they said died within these halls. Travis, a co-worker in the cafe, also mentioned that a few minutes after he opened, he went into the men's locker room, and he noticed that it was steamy and smelled like soap. So he went into the shower room to investigate, and everything was soaking wet and still hot. He was the only person who was supposed to be there at that time of day, but didn't see anyone, so he let it go. A couple of months later, Tim noticed this weird side door that he had to climb up a rickety old staircase on the side of the building, and it wasn't shut correctly. He fixed it, and it locked correctly soon after, and didn't think anything more of it. Shortly after, someone from the golf course came over to tell me that they found someone's entire life packed away in one of their hundreds of lockers that no one uses. They thought that someone was living in the storage room between the men's and women's bathrooms. He must have been coming in before the golf course people set the alarms when they left in the evenings and leaving after the cafe person, that being me, would come in and turn off the alarm in the morning. So that means that every morning, as I blindly shuffled my way down that long, dark hallway alone, one of those pitch black doorways actually did have someone hiding behind it. Anyway, fast forward a few days later, a red-faced, angry, bald man in Vietnam-era army issued glasses came into the cafe and started screaming. He's also puffing and flailing his arms around, yelling about his stuff getting thrown out. He went over to berate the golf course people, so they asked him about the contents of the locker. His answers about specific items led them to realize this was the man who was secretly living in one of this building's many dark passageways. I never found out much about him, whether he was dangerous or just homeless, but watching him scream about his stuff did make it clear that he wasn't 100% rational. I still work there, and I do a darkness shuffle down the hall every morning when I work, and although they say everything is on the up and up with the alarms and the doors locking, it still creeps me the hell out. There have been some other creepy things that have happened in this place recently. It makes me think that this isn't all over with, which I will post separately if anyone is interested. Edit. The updated post got taken down, so here it is. Monday, I noticed a pad of paper, as well as a long metal pair of tweezers, which were clipped underneath the stairs. I thought it probably had something to do with inventory because right before, a manager came in to count our food stuff and beverages. Also, it wasn't an area that is easily accessed by customers but not technically locked in any way during the daytime. Today, my friend who works at the bar upstairs actually told me that someone brought this pad to her and it has some pretty schizophrenic thoughts on it. It has lots of stuff about how electric cars work to support some kind of government agenda surrounding social media, as well as some plans to patent for some sort of alternative energy source. It involved the UN and foreign passports. Now, this part of the building is not under video surveillance, so I have no idea who left it, and if they were planning on coming back or not, but it could be the same guy from before. He seemed pretty unhinged, and definitely liked to spend a lot of time in weird parts of this building. I have had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back when I was 20 years old, 
Me and my family, which consisted of my mom and little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a town down south. It was a huge change, and as I had been having a difficult time, I did welcome the change of scenery. It was a beautiful town after all. It was in an affluent part of the country. However, I struggled to find a job, and so became very frustrated as my mom needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. I will call him Phil in this story. If ever he saw us doing some shopping, he would come and chat and ask how the family was, and he genuinely seemed like a decent, caring bloke. So when he said he might have a job for me in his shop with a small flat upstairs I could rent for next to nothing, I thought, well okay, great, maybe things are looking up. Phil got our address and then told me and my mother he would pop by early evening time when he had finished and then take me in the car to go and see the flat. I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable and I'm feeling excited and confident thinking, wow, a job and a flat? I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and would make a great employee. So around 8pm he knocks on the front door and my mother answers. He tells her we will probably only be about half an hour and he will have me back safe and sound in no time. Now I didn't take my phone with me as I had no credit to call out and I didn't think I would be needing it for a quick trip up the road and back. In hindsight, a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I had my phone on me that would have deterred him from what he was about to do. Anyway, it's already dark out as it's March. I get into his car and we start driving and he's chatting away asking how I am and he's telling me what the flat is like. Well, within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed that we're not taking the conventional route that takes us directly into town. At first I think he is taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it and just reason with myself that he knows the area well and I don't really mind. 30 seconds after. I realize he's taking me in the completely opposite direction and I can tell that we are driving away from the populated town and into an area where trees swamp both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime thinking where the hell is this guy taking me and I just about manage to keep my composure and I ask him outright, where are we going? Town's back the other way. I just thought I would take you on a little tour. It's beautiful out here. There's many forests and peaceful places I would love to show you. He says this in his normal, cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything at that moment because the logical and the reasoning sides of my brain were in full blown out war. I'm trying to keep calm thinking, well okay he seems fairly normal, so why wouldn't he want to show me around if it is a stunning area full of natural beauty? He is probably proud to show me where he lives. The logical side however disagreed. And then a wave of panic comes over me and a little voice enters my head and shouts, What in the dark? Shit no, are you stupid? So I just sit there in silence taking in the scenery, which is becoming more sinister by the second. Because at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think. All I know is every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. So I started looking for signposts, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything really that would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had a bolt from the car. Phil can obviously sense some nervous, so he's just talking away at me about what the job's like and how his staff are very friendly, and before I know it he has slowed down to a crawl, and he has turned down a little mud road with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. My stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his vehicle because the reality of what is about to potentially happen hits me like a freight train. I'm thinking to myself, if I jump out here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere. However, my imagination starts rather helpfully flashing images of him grabbing me. That's before I get a chance to get out the door. So I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I'm just thinking to myself, if he attacks me, don't make a sound. Don't give him the satisfaction of showing him I'm scared. 
My brain was about as useful as a chocolate teapot, and I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was terrified. So we come out at the top of this little dirt road, and there is a tiny little car parked, which is surrounded by woodland, with one car sat in it. It was clear there were people in there having sex, and as he pulls near the car, I realize he has brought me to a local dodging spot. He now turns to me, and then puts his hand on my knee. We should do what they're doing, with a deadly serious expression on his face. I make this bizarre half-nervous laugh, half-garbled, I pitched whining and I tried to laugh off the suggestion, that way I could show him I'm not into it and I'm super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle, which sounds like I've swallowed a potato whole, does clearly freak him out and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. It will be fun, no one will see us, he persists. No, I don't want to. Plus, I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lie. But he sits there just smiling at me like a Cheshire cat. Like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face. Mom will be expecting me home now. I tell him after an insanely uncomfortable 30 seconds more of this. As I try my damn hardest not to make eye contact. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a bit longer with me. You can trust me, you know. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip and I tell him again. Mom is waiting for me. She'll start panicking if I'm not home in the next few minutes. Take me home. I look him straight in the face and he knows that I'm not messing around. Okay, that's fine. I'll take it back now. Without another word, he drives me out of that creepy seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seat belt button ready to jump out. As we pull up outside our home, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away, and before he can stop me, I mount and slam the door behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of his vehicle and my heart sinks. I think I'll pop in and see your mom real quickly, he tells me and I swear I can see a smirk on his face, but I know he is only doing this because he's freaking out knowing damn well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. Before I can try and talk him out of it, my mother has heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge past her with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab a small knife out of the drawer, and fly into my little sister's room like a madwoman. Don't you dare leave this room, no matter what you hear, I whisper to her. Seeing the knife I'm stuffing up my sleeve, she just looks at me with panic in her eyes and whispers back, Okay. I walk back into the living room and the cheeky twat is sat on one sofa sprawled out. He's comfortable as all hell, like he is at home. I see red, and I swear I felt like the Hulk. I'm ready for the bastard. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa mom is sitting on the absolute furthest away from him I can manage, as he just sits there making small talk with mother about how she's finding the area, are the neighbors friendly, all the while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on me every move. Why don't you come over and sit next to me? He pats the sofa cushion next to him. Nah, I'm alright here, thanks, I tell him as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you sat over there? Come, come here. Honestly, I won't bite you. He laughs, and then pats the seat next to him again. No, I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. This time through gritted teeth. My mom, bless her, is looking at us during this back and forth like a tennis match. And I can see something is registering in her eyes. She can see my behavior is all off. I've got one bum cheek weirdly perched on the sofa arm, so I'm half stood up half sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as hell, and I'm staring my mom in the face intensely. Mentally, I'm trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. I must have looked like a nutter. It's getting late now, so I think you should go. She finally speaks. Mother is starting to look anxious now, as she had finally realized that something has happened. Phil gets up and agrees, and then mumbles something about having to check something at his shop. 
That's when he walks by me and is nearly out the room. He pauses and turns to me and puts out his hand to shake mine. I'm thinking to myself, what a weird thing to do. I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had the knife. He took it with a bit more force than is polite, and he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when the tip of the blade had jabbed him. He looked down and saw the blade, and then he looked at me. I looked at him with such disgust. Phil then hightailed it out of her house so fast without another word. A prick for a prick. I told mom everything, and obviously she was fuming. We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime committed on his part, aside from being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned it to a couple of girls my age who lived down her street, they clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I guess he had probably done this type of thing before. We moved away from the area after that, and I'm glad to report I have never seen his smug face ever again. So, Phil, let's not meet. Recently, there was an amber alert, and my daughter was asking me what the beeping sound was all about. For those who don't know, an amber alert goes out when a child is reported missing. If you receive notifications, you know what I'm talking about. The alert will sometimes give information, such as the victim's appearance, as well as the perpetrator, the location of the abduction, make and model a vehicle, etc. My phone started beeping one evening while helping my daughter clean her room. It was an amber alert. She asked about it. I gave her a small rundown and what it was. However, it triggered a childhood memory I have where I believe with all my heart that I was almost kidnapped when I was a kid. Now, to be clear, this isn't a memory that was laying dormant in my subconscious, and this random amber alert and talk with my kid caused it to resurface in my mind. This incident is something I've pondered and thought about off and on for years now. I'm 41 years old, and male by the way. It's just been a while since I've considered the factors and the details of the experience, and this recent amber alert and talk with my daughter really caused me to pause, as well as reflect on the incident itself once again. And well, here I am. As a parent, you worry about these things, and you do all you can to protect your children, especially when you personally have experienced something so truly scary like this. The occurrence happened when I was just a young kid. My guess is around 7 to 8 years old. I can't be sure, but I think that's a safe estimate based on the fact that much of those early childhood memories aren't there anymore. I do remember my kindergarten experience though, which I would have been around 5 to 6 years old, and also later grades. So this incident must have happened sometime after or around the ages of 7 to 8 years old. My parents took me to a neighboring city to do some shopping. We lived in a small rural town with not much on offer. So from time to time we would go to this neighboring city about 45 minutes from where we were located. But it just had more to offer. They would take me up there for school clothing shopping, out to eat because restaurants were better, and because my mom was a crafter. She loved to make crafts, it was her thing. There was different craft stores and a fabric store she liked going up to there. This specific trip, we went to a fabric store up there, Joe Ann Fabrics to be exact. This was a pretty big store. As a little kid, I guess most every place seems big, but no kidding, this was a sizable store. My dad sat out in the car, meanwhile I went in with my mom. He did that a lot, sit in the car when there was a store he just didn't want to go into, so I can't blame him there. I can't recall exactly what all my mom was looking for or trying to get in that store that day, but I do remember what section we were in, an area with a bunch of racks with various fabrics hanging. Imagine a clothing store with circular racks with clothes hanging around them, and that's pretty much what it's like at this fabric store. Racks of hanging fabrics. I remember this area being slightly toward the beginning or entrance of the store. As my mom was looking through these racks, I began to wander, though not far, just enough to kind of look around myself. That in itself was caused by boredom. 
I could still see my mother just up and over a few racks away, so it wasn't like I was on the other side of the store or anything. A random man then approached me, and honestly I can't even remember at what direction he came from. It's just like I was there by myself one minute, and the next I looked up and saw this guy. It was like he came in fast and out of nowhere. So I quickly looked over to where my mom was. She had moved a few racks up and away, but I could still see her. There was still a fair bit of distance between my mom and I at this point. So here I am standing behind some rack of fabric with this older guy. He's opposite of me in the other side of this rack. Then he speaks. Hey little boy, how you doing there? I remained as silent because this took me completely off guard. He asked, where are you folks at? Are you alone in here? I stood still and quiet. Come here, I got something to show you. At this point, he started advancing toward me, coming around the rack to where I was. I quickly started the other way, however he stopped and started coming around the other way, as if to meet me in the middle. I was scared at this moment, and I became instantly aware that this man seemed dangerous, and like he was trying to get a hold of me. Come here, he barked. I jerked fast to the left, but he did the same. He had this wild look in his eyes. Whichever direction I went, he followed. But remember, there's a rack between us. God, I'm so thankful for that rack. After some back and forth movements from me and this man, I finally lock in on my mom and yell, Mom, help. You would have thought I screamed a bloody murder, as it was so loud, but it did get my mom's attention. What's wrong? She asked. This startled the man, and he looked over his shoulder in the direction of my gaze and confirmed, Yep, that must be his mother. His demeanor completely changes, and it's as if everything is just fun and games, and he was just messing around. He says, I was just messing around with him. No harm, ma'am. My mom came to where I was, and as we reconnected, the guy just tips his hat on my mom and makes his way out of the store. I explained to my mom what had just happened, that this guy was trying to get me, that I was so upset and shook up. She told me I did the right thing by yelling and getting her attention. It was terrifying for sure, and I'm thankful something crazy didn't actually happen. Could I have been imagining things, like maybe this guy was really just messing around? I very much think that there were nefarious intentions. I mean, why would a random older guy be pursuing a fabric store? If he was there for something like crafts or fabrics, why would he promptly leave when confronted? Well, I truly believe that he was up to no good. Anyway, that's my story, and I appreciate anyone taking the time to read. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I just figured though that she was weirded out that I didn't wake her sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and went on with my day. You can't win them all. I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized I hadn't asked her name. I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name was Lucy, right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say, she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks I got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak, and finding out about my personal life. I'm a serial oversharer, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in by saying how messed up things were, and that she'd kick my friend's ass for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even at 16, I knew that was cringy, and I was going through my emo phase. The thing that really bugged me at the time was that she asked so much about me, but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel shitty always venting and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days and I let another girl sit by me since it was an overcrowded bus and I didn't think it mattered. When Lucy arrived back and saw me with another girl, well you'd think she was shot. However, she just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. 
I can't remember what exactly Lucy said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her rival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while things started getting hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities, and at any time I got upset about it, she would just give me shit for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy wanted to break me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus, and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. Now, I don't remember the first time she hit me. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory, some kind of cinematic moment in my life. Honestly, it's just blended together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and a playful slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive until she slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a shitty joke and she shoved me hard into the wall. She then laughed because of the sound I made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us, but they didn't do anything about it. Sometimes I wonder what they thought of me. Now, I didn't dump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right, or it was an honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time. However, every time I did, she had a new sob story I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get in my head that she was some tragic soul and that I could help her. I convinced myself there had to be something noble about taking the abuse and nobody I knew tried to step in or stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three week span. First I found out she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and then posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. It felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse though. She seemed excited, sort of like I'd be happy she invaded my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. After about a half hour on my chest not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at our stop and she just got up, looked me in the eye, and told me she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't even try to be cute or romantic about it or anything. It was just, I pretend to sleep on you sometimes. Like what the hell? The breaking point came when she was showing off some award she got from school. There was something off about the award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had a name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem is it wasn't addressed to a Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out I didn't know my own girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights, and I broke things off. Lucy was always the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop though. It felt like she wanted me to know that she was watching me. One day when she got on the bus, she looked at me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to her new seat. I'm pretty sure she was expecting me to say something to her. Well, the next year I graduated and I got a retail job. End of story, right? Well, so I thought. It was the start of Christmas season and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store I was working at, random chance. It had been a year and a half since we broke up at this point, so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend it wasn't weird, right? Well, she gave me the look that the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nut. She grabbed something from the front and then went right into my line. She didn't say a word to me, but she wouldn't break eye contact, and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt to look at her. I rang her up silently and I waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support and he told me she was giving her weird vibes. I got this really bad gut feeling after she left. Lucy became a regular at her little shop. She would come in and creep out my coworkers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came in while ringing her out. 
and she said she was visiting me. She, however, didn't say my name, but she described how I looked. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in on one of the areas boarding my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store, despite complaints, because the managers were penny-pinching assholes. They would sell any one of us to get sales up. Now, I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times, and then heard how often she came in. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth the minimum wage. The last time I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance so you could see right in front of the store proper. I left to put up the stuff in my cart and when I came back I saw her. She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance still as a statue. I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours before she suddenly turned and walked briskly away. The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I got back there. She was a lot more awkward after that. The girl quit three days later and she just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I don't know. I left the store not too long after that, and I got a job that didn't involve customer service. That wasn't however the last time I saw her. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I actually did have a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable, and that Lucy was the only person I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her. With stars in the sky, lit by street lamps, I did actually see her. She was actually with another girl. I got so close I could almost touch her before I then snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and then I realized I was becoming her. So I ran home and I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week. I was walking home from work and I decided to stop for dinner. I thought I saw her in line, but I convinced myself it was someone else. I ordered and I sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate, and she took the table between me and the window I was looking out of. She was with some guy that looked vaguely familiar, perhaps a school friend. She was sat in an angle, so she was half looking at him and every few seconds she would look right at me. Now, I know it was her. She even changed her hair in the process. It looks an awful a lot like mine now. Anyway, after I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick, and after washing my hands, I looked into the mirror, and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she's going to turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up. Lucy has been part of my life for the last four years. We dated for four months in high school, and she keeps turning up. I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, but I feel like she broke me as a person and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I have developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous leaving my house, and people who show interest in me immediately put me on the edge. I've tried to date since everything happened. However, I just can't. I'm just too much work at this point, so I've decided that I'm going to stay single until I can work through my issues. I'm begging you, Lucy. Please, let's never meet again. I honestly don't really know how to begin or even deal with this entire situation, but to keep it short, I've been touched in my sleep by him for four times now, and throughout them all my mother hasn't really done anything about it, but yell at him throughout text. She'd send me a screenshot, but that was pretty much it. It's a little infuriating since he'd manipulate her into thinking he was just putting a blanket over me, to which I replied, who the hell is he to put one on me like that? And are you just going to ignore the fact he went into my room? He also guilt tripped her by saying, 
We can't do much if that's what she thinks. Because, you know, I'm not one to do that. Let her be. Just pretend to be mad at me when we come home. She acted poorly. It was way too obvious. Bear in mind, I've gone through past situations with family members, grandfather and cousin. I can't exactly leave the home since I'm honestly not prepared to live alone yet and I'm still saving up. No matter how much I barricade my room, he would still get inside. I had to hide and change my toothbrush also because it was always used. I always had to wear a bra even in my sleep. I'm seriously reaching my limit. Anyway, I woke up one day to the sound of a kiss close to me. I thought to myself, my mother wasn't home because she was at work at 6am. I continued to pretend to be sleeping and I heard him whisper, I love you, close to my face. I've never been so creeped out to the point that I actually trembled. The next day, my mother was away again. I bought so many locks, and yet he was still able to get in. I woke up, continued to pretend to be sleeping, and jolted my eyes open to see him sitting there watching my face up close. He scrambled out of the door though. That's when I knew I had to do something, and I'm not safe anymore. I sleep with a weapon on me now every night. I never told my mother about these recent behaviors though because I know she won't believe me sadly or do anything serious about it. So if it ever happens again, I'm going to have to muster up all my courage to stand up for myself and confront him again. By the way, this man child has no contribution at all to the house. He's an IRL leech. I buy groceries and I pay bills while my mother pays for rent. This happened about 11 months ago when me and my wife got married in June. I'll never be so grateful that I have a habit of locking doors. Our wedding day was coming to an end. Family and friends were slowly starting to depart as me and my wife Diana took pictures and chatted with some of the guests who stayed a little longer and were just having a great time. It was a great day and a lot of fond memories were made. But what was least expected is what happened that night as we were on our way to our honeymoon. As me and Diana said goodbye to the last of the guests, 9pm, we got into the car and we headed home. We had our bags packed prior to the wedding day for Cancun and were ready to go. I live in Washington and we were in a bit of a hurry because instead of flying out from the Seattle airport to SeaTac like normally, it was actually a lot cheaper for us to drive up north to Canada and then fly out from a Canadian airport. Also, me and my wife thought it'd be fun to have a little road trip to Canada and then fly out from Canada to Cancun. Plus, it was only a three and a half hour drive for us and it was cheaper so we headed out. 12 AM. We had a great time driving and blasting music talking about Cancun and just being excited about the new chapter in our life. Diana slowly started to fall asleep. She was exhausted from the wedding and whatnot. Anyway, we were halfway to Canada. At this point, we were no longer in city area, but more a wooded area with fewer cars, as well as fewer people the more we drove, practically seeing no one on the road. By that time, it was around 3 AM. We had some extra time on our hands and I was starting to fall asleep too, so I pulled over to a gas station to get some Red Bull to keep me awake. I pulled into the gas station that was completely empty and I parked the car to see Diana sleep. I told her I'm taking the keys and I'm locking her inside and that I was going to be right back. Not sure if she could hear me but she kind of motioned her hand around like people normally do when they're too tired to care. I came back around 6 minutes later and I find my wife shaking and crying. I was confused and freaking out a bit since I wasn't sure why she was crying to begin with. She couldn't even get words out at first. Later, once she calmed down, this is what she said. Apparently, she did hear me when I told her I'd take the keys and be right back. And as she was sleeping, she was awoken by a tapping on the driver's side window being too tired to get up or even open her eyes. She lazily went for the unlock button on the passenger side of the door. As she was going for it, she froze and a thought passed her mind. Then she remembered. Didn't he say he had the keys? 
Why would he need me to unlock the door for him? That's when she heard a woman's voice mumbling from the driver's side. She turned herself around to look at the window and saw a woman, long black hair with white eyes, and a crooked smile on her face as well. She couldn't hear what she was saying at first, but then she heard what she was saying. She kept repeating in a mumbled tone, Are you tired? Over and over again. She freaked out and told the woman to leave her alone. The woman laughed and then told my wife that she was tired too. The woman never took her eyes off of her and tried the door handle. At this point, my wife was close to tears and so attempted to call me, but as she did, she heard what sounded like a phone buzz and realized I left my phone in the car. Out of options, my wife started to honk on the horn, trying to scare off the woman, while also maybe getting my attention. The woman still had her gaze on her, and then started mumbling more while laughing, and then trying the door handle again. Then she mentioned something about someone named Sarah. Then she asked my wife if she knew her. After a few more minutes of mumbling, she then left. To my wife's words, the minute she left, I came out of the gas station, so that's when my wife broke down. I don't know how I didn't hear the honking of the car, and I still feel bad for leaving my phone in the vehicle. My wife also added that one of the creepier things about that woman is she didn't look homeless or dirty or anything. In fact, she seemed normal and well kept. My wife said that she'll never forget the woman's white eyes or even the gaze she had on her with that smile. It also chills me to think just what would have happened if my wife never realized that I had the keys, or if she never heard me about locking her inside and opened the door while faced the other way. I don't know what those women's intentions were, but if I couldn't hear the honk of a horn, I'm not sure I'd hear her screams. To this day, I'm thankful I have a good habit of locking doors, and I'd recommend it no matter how long you're going to be gone for. So that was the last story for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed yourself and you had a good time. Again, as I mentioned in the intro, if this was the first time you joined us, then do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all the future uploads coming here to the channel. Also, make sure to leave a like rating if you enjoyed it and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share, then send it in with my user submissions email, which appears on screen on my videos, tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for more of the Creepy Fox, then check out all the other videos I got on my channel. There's so much narration content that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I've also got some exclusive Scary Stories narration episodes. If you'd like to listen to those, then for as little as $2 a month, you can become a Creepy Fox channel member and gain access to 10 plus hours of extra additional content. I also got some cool merch which is featured down below. There's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. I got a lot of things that you might like, so check it out, see if you might find something on the Creepy Fox shop. Lastly, it's not something I really talk about or mention, but I wanted to go ahead and plug my other social media. If you wanted to follow me on my Instagram, I'm pretty active there. It's at the creepy fox official. You can see the name on the bottom right of all my videos. I like to post videos of my pets, specifically my dog and my birds, so if you're somebody that likes animals, then give me a follow and check out my stories. I'm always posting daily. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much everyone for watching today, and I'll go ahead and catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.